Greetings, War Thunderers. This is Longshot with a guide on how to fly the P-51D5 in Arcade. This is a Tier 4 plane, current battle rating of 4.0, and it is of course the first in the series of P-51Ds which were probably the most iconic American fighters of World War II. I've been meaning to make a video on this plane for quite some time, but I've kept putting it off. And there's several reasons for that. Firstly, a lot of people seriously love this plane, not because of how it flies in War Thunder, but simply because it's a Mustang. And that leads them to either ignore its drawbacks in this game, or to get enraged that such drawbacks exist. Where strong emotions attach to a plane, heated arguments will often follow, and being the gentle retiring sort that I am, that's something that I wanted to avoid. There are also people who spend hundreds of hours mastering this plane and will doubtless pick out the myriad of flaws in my flying and say, long shot, you should have done it this way and avoided that manoeuvre you did at the 9 minute mark in the video, etc, etc. Then you would have seen how great this plane really is. To which I say that sure, I'm not an expert at flying this plane, nor am I likely to become one. I'm continually switching planes, so I'm very much a jack of all trades and master of none. I have however done my best to stick purely to the facts as I see them in this video. All I can do is be honest, and call it how I see it. So let me do just that. This plane in War Thunder performs nothing like the historical D5. It has enough outright errors in its flight and damage models that I can confidently describe it as broken, and not in a good way. The other D models share the same flaws, but the D5 is the worst of the bunch. So why create this video? Well, many players would like to know exactly how it's broken, and some might want to persist and fly it anyway, because after all, it is a Mustang. Right, so, here's the armour, and it's pretty standard for a Tier 4 plane, shielding front and back and some hardened glass. The X-ray shows fuel tanks, lots of fuel tanks, in the wings and behind the pilot. Forget any ideas you may have about self-sealing fuel tanks, as these babies like to burn. This plane, like the P-38G, is notoriously good at spontaneous combustion. And if you somehow don't catch a light, don't worry, the plane is very fragile and is happy to lose wings or tail controls. By the way, you may have noticed that I don't have the plane spaded yet, but rest assured all I'm lacking are the ground attack modifications. Alright, so it's time to fire up a test flight and see how it flies. Starting with its climb rate. The best climbing airspeed is around 280 km an hour, at which from a 2000m arcade spawn it will reach 4000m in 2 weps, and 4800m in 3 weps. That's an average climb rate for a Tier 4 plane. It's not bad by any means. Focke Wolf 190s, Yaks, La 5s and I-185s all have similar climb rates. And so, though, does the earlier P-51 with Hispanos. It reaches the same altitudes as the D-5 in the same time frame, despite having a much less powerful Allison engine compared to the D-5's Merlin, despite being weighed down with four cannons and all their ammunition, and despite spawning at a speed that's on average about 40 km an hour slower than the D-5 gets when it spawns. Logically, the D-5 should be a much better climber than the Hispano P-51, but it isn't. Nor does it start to outperform the Hispano P-51 at higher altitude, and I'll show more of that later in the video. Let's take a look at the plane's roll rate. Not bad, but certainly not as fast as many Tier 4 energy fighters. What's more, let me show you a comparison of the D-5 and the Hispano P-51. The D-5 should roll faster, not slower. Next I'll look at its turning circle using elevators. It's just as wide as the Hispano P-51s, and neither can it catch a smoke trail. You will not win many turning battles with this plane. How about its rudder authority? To test that, I'll hit left rudder and up elevator together. And the plane wants to climb far more than it wants to yaw to the side, so the D-5's elevators are weak, but the rudder is weaker still. I'm trying to continue this in a climbing spiral, but that steep angle has bled away all of my speed very quickly, and at 180 km an hour, this plane does not want to climb or turn. So now we come to the crucial test for this plane, how well it performs in a dive. The D5s were, after all, renowned for being extremely fast, with brilliant high-speed handling. As its rudder's weak, the roll speed is very important here. If the plane can't roll quickly at high speed, it can't get guns on dodging targets. The other factor is its energy retention, but roll speed first. It starts to stiffen up uh, past 500 km an hour, and past 600 it's quite slow, so that's not good. 
In a dive from almost 5,000 metres, it barely makes it over 800 kilometres an hour. So much for this plane being fast. It's not much faster than a Spitfire. It can track the mouse in small increments, but a larger correction will make it lift the nose. And these simple manoeuvres are costing it a lot of speed. So before I lose too much, I'll see how it goes in a vertical zoom climb. I was doing just under 700 kilometres an hour when I started the climb, and it barely recovers 1,800 metres before it drops under 200 kilometres an hour. And that, my friends, is very poor indeed. There are numerous lower-tiered early warplanes with better dive and zoom climb abilities than this P-51D5. So anyway, let's see how well it can perform a hammerhead turn. It takes quite a long time to flip over, and before it completes a turn it stalls and I have to wait to bring it under control. Once again, let me compare its performance in the dive to the Hispano P-51, which is one of the earliest Mustangs, with a less efficient airframe and a less powerful engine. I began the dive from the same altitude and airspeed. You can see how vastly superior the earlier P-51's roll rate is at high speed. Not only that, the early model gets to 860 km an hour, whereas the D-5 only just reached 835. Both planes want to lift the nose when they track the mouse, but the Canon Mustang corrects a lot faster and loses less speed in the manoeuvring. By comparison, its handling is far more precise and snappy, whereas the D5 feels sluggish and reluctant. I guess it wouldn't surprise you to learn that the Canon Mustang recovers 400 metres more in the zoom climb than the later model, or that it can perform a more efficient stall hammerhead turn. There's one more thing I haven't mentioned the D5's acceleration. Now, let me put it this way, a 1950 Volkswagen Beetle has better acceleration than this plane. Before I continue, I'll just put this in a nutshell for you. The D5 should be a strongly built, extremely fast plane with great energy retention, high speed handling and high altitude performance. The D5 in War Thunder is a fragile, flammable plane that's not particularly fast, has relatively poor high speed handling, poor high altitude performance and bleeds energy like a stuck pig. If you're flying this plane, I can describe it for you in two words. It is a death trap. If you see an enemy D5, I'm sure you already know an appropriate two-word description, but I'll say it anyway. It's an easy kill. Also, every D model suffers from savage recoil that kicks the nose upwards, making it incredibly hard to aim accurately. This is a plane for masochists. But let's say you fit that description. OK, what tactics do you use with such a plane? As the plane's so fragile and has relatively weak armament, you need to avoid head-ons. And as it will lose if forced into a dogfight, you need to climb and try and get an altitude advantage as then you can look to boom and zoom, which despite its mediocre high-speed handling is really your only strategy in a D5. Your only hope of getting that altitude advantage is side climbing. And if an enemy sees you and picks you out, as Velox has done in his J2M behind me, you need to turn your back on the battle and run away. Yes indeed, this is how the Allies won the war in the air over Europe. They turned tail and fled whenever there was a chance of an engagement on equal terms. I bet you didn't know that, did you? But if War Thunder's version of the D5 is correct, then it must be true. Your success in gaining an altitude advantage using this tactic will depend on two things. How far it is until you hit the borders of the map, and how determined the enemy is to chase you down. Let's assume you avoid being chased, and manage to climb unmolested. By the time you return to the battle, it'll all often nearly be over, and you'll have simply wasted all of your time. This game's on an assault map, where, unlike ground strike, the tanks do not self-destruct, making longer battles possible. So it seems I have control of high altitude. Now it's a matter of exploiting it. But before I can start boom and zooming, I need to deal with the squad of two J2Ms flown by experienced pilots who are aware of me and watching my movements. And that's not uncommon. It's usually the better players who climb and remain at bomber altitude, so unless your team has already won the battle for altitude, you'll have your work cut out for you. So begins a battle of position, of baiting and fake attacks, as the J2Ms separate and try to either draw me down off altitude or trick me into dragon bag situations. This has much more in common with a realistic battle than arcade. Eventually I'm in a position where I feel I can attack one of the J2Ms safely, so I dive to engage as he passes underneath me. But despite having a 2000 metre altitude advantage, my acceleration in the dive isn't enough to get into gun's range, despite using web. I mean, I'm catching him, but nowhere near as quickly as I would have expected and hoped. 
and after a while I level off and he exit his shallow dive and seems to back off the throttle and climb, slowing down purposely to keep me interested. I decide to give it another shot, but it's taking me forever to close in and before the lead indicator appears, he starts to increase his dive angle, so at this point I've had enough and I abort the attack. I mean, I know what he was trying to do, draw me down off altitude, so I'm not going to do that and I'm into a zoom climb as gently as I can and I won't manoeuvre until I've assessed the situation. My target's pulled a split S and doesn't appear to be a threat and his squad mate Velox is still 4 kilometres away and has climbed to around 6,000 metres. He's closing in so I need to continue extending away from him as I regain altitude. Then he gives up the chase, so I slowly start to pull the nose around, again as gently as I can to avoid bleeding more energy than I can help. Now both of them are flying away from me. There's nothing I can do about it because my speed's already in the low 200s. By the time I've completed the turn and recovered my altitude, they're miles away, and I'm still travelling slowly. I could easily fill an entire video with this kind of thing, but I guess you've seen enough. After several minutes, I managed to get above both of them, along with another J2M who was down there, while they were engaging a friendly Kai-43, and I hoped to finally score a kill with a diving attack. My target, however, was aware of me, and began to roll at a speed that I couldn't hope to follow. He ducked away, and once again I'm zoom climbing, after another fruitless attack. Another minute goes by, during which I manage to sneak up behind while they're attacking a B-25. This time they finally seemed to have lost track of me. As I watch the B-25 crash dives, and I'm half expecting them all to follow him, but the GSTGD guys keep their altitude and still seem oblivious to my presence. It's a steady target, but the nose bucks up and down making it difficult to aim, but he's on fire, so on to the next one. This guy's already manoeuvring, so I don't expect to land a shot here, but he straightened up for a second, and he too is now alight. First guy's put his fire out already, but dives away for repairs, and the second plane burns out giving me my first kill, over 11 minutes after the start of the battle. And it's not as if I outflew those planes, I just caught them napping after they took their eye off me, and the powerful recoil made it very difficult to land hits on both of their planes. I could easily have missed altogether and come away with nothing. Anyway, now the third member of the squad decides to take a shot at me in his B-25 so I pull up just out of range to slow him down as he tries to follow me. Now comes the difficult task of shooting him down without taking damage from his gunners. I decide to risk a high speed attack from directly above. And this is risky. No damage, and I need to break off and get underneath his plane, and away from him. But before I can do so he lands a hit, but I'm still in the air. Okay, time to try for a shot at his belly, where his gunner can't get at me. Here we go. Set him alight. Okay, time for a split S. And his gunner somehow hits me with a single shot, and that's enough to set me alight too. Very, very occasionally a P-51D will survive a fire, but I've never fluked that dice roll, and I don't on this occasion either. This plane is simply too fragile and too flammable to be good at hunting bombers. OK, so that was just one game. Perhaps it's not representative. I'll take a quick look at a few others. This is around the five minute mark in a Mozdok domination. I've been stalking and playing chess with this A7M1 for a while. I've already tried one boom and zoom that failed. Now I'm going to catch him with a lucky pass as he aborts an attack on the Kai-49 below. Rolling to match his heading, which is essential in this plane and the 50 cals do their job. OK, so that gives me control of altitude in this game. I'm now free to boom and zoom to my heart's content. Or am I? The guy I shot down has returned in a Kai-84, and so far he hasn't dived into the furball. He hasn't climbed either, he's just maintaining his speed at spawn altitude. And as I dive to attack he turns to the left to get inside my dive, and then lifts up into a climb, perhaps trying for a head-on, though the angle was too sharp, and to be honest he was lucky I didn't get a similar shot to the one that killed his A7M1. OK, so I'm zoom climbing to retain my altitude advantage, and there's no way he should have the energy to follow me. Looks like he's thinking of trying, but then the range started to increase, indicating that he's leveled off, so I exit my zoom climb and watch him again. He's obviously still a threat, I need to keep an eye on him, but now it looks like he's diving into the furball. Seeing that, I start looking around for other targets. After a few moments though, I suddenly realise that his dive was merely a means of gaining speed and he's now helicoptering straight up underneath me. 
So up into a climb, and I'm easily keeping pace with him. He started his climb earlier than me, so he should be the first to stall. And anticipating this, I turn horizontally, then I'm into a dive, expecting to see that his nose has dropped. But no, he still has the energy to keep hanging from his propeller, so suddenly it's a head-on, which neither of us survive. But I can't blame the D5 for that death. It was simply an error on my part, underestimating his speed and commencing my attack a little too early. Though it does show why you should always avoid head-ons in this plane, and how difficult it is to deal with someone who wants to engage you, even if you do have an altitude advantage. Ideally, you want to blindside people if you can, like I'm trying to do with this A7M1, except that blasted recoil kicked my nose upwards and I missed the shot. All D models share that behaviour, and it's really quite infuriating. I don't know of another 50 cal armed plane that suffers from anything like the degree of recoil that this plane does. And I must admit that sometimes I lost patience with the plane, and started to fly it more aggressively and pull harder turns simply out of frustration. And here's a great example showing what happens when you make this mistake in a D5. I'm lined up on this P-47, and land what I think is a pretty accurate burst, but only get a hit. And then he outrolls me with ease, and forces me to overshoot. Yep, no hope of following in that manoeuvre at all, so I'm away. I'm clear of him, there's no one else around, so I decide to Immelman with full elevator and try for another shot, knowing that it's costing me at least 250 kilometers an hour in the maneuver, but I don't care, I want the kill. I aimed inside the indicator expecting him to turn toward me, but he didn't, so I rolled to adjust and score another hit. The minimap showed a cloud of enemies closing in, I know I can't outrun them as the Immelman blew my energy, so I need to turn and evade their attacks. Pass the first one. I fire at this spit too and then evade. OK, that's two. My gun's doing no damage, of course. Then they're firing at long range as I run away. The spit will be right on my tail soon. And yep, I'm on fire. So I know I'm dead. I may as well take this hurricane with me. And there's no point trying to shoot him down. Now, it's not as if this plane can't get kills. All you need is for your target to fly nice and straight, even while you light them up with a long burst, as demonstrated by this 109, who was fixated on the Fogglewolf 200 and completely ignored me. If you're pulling directly upwards while firing, as I was during that shot, it seems to nullify the recoil, uh, which does help your accuracy. Here's another example of the plane's effectiveness in boom and zooming a straight flying target. I start a dive toward the A6M3, see the F6F spawn in and turn toward him, intending to pull upwards if he tried for a head-on, after which I try for a rope dope Instead he just turned to the left and climbed nice and slow, exposing the full profile of his plane, and that will be an easy kill. If only you could get battles full of opponents who flew like this and offered their planes up as sacrifices on the altar of the almighty Mustang, it would be so much easier. I saw my friend Corgoth had drawn a train here, so I'm into a long boom and zoom attack. But because of its poor acceleration and energy retention, the D5 is not suited to long shallow boom and zooms, as I showed against the J2M2 earlier. Two of the enemies saw me coming and split Est away. That leaves the, the 185 and I'm having to use WEP to close him down, as my plane simply isn't fast enough. Finally I'm within range, he holds nice and still for me at the top of his climb, and despite the reticle bouncing around, I get the kill. But now I need to extend away from another 185 that's chasing me, and I have no whip. He's not closing in very fast, but there's no doubt he's going to catch me. Then Corgoth comes to the rescue and engages the 185, so I level off before I get too slow, and the dying 185 has enough control and energy to be able to rip off my elevators. That only happened because this plane is simply too slow, and when it does get speed under its wings, it can't retain it. I really wish I could show you tactics that allow you to overcome the plane's drawbacks, but I really don't think such tactics exist. The D5 is slow, it can't turn, it lacks roll speed, it's a poor climber, and if someone gets guns on you, you're dead. That's why I've held off making a video on the P-51Ds for such a long time, having first considered it, considered it over a year ago. To me, many aspects of their flight models are demonstrably wrong. The D5 is the worst, as it has the least amount of engine power, but all of them share the same handling characteristics. I had hoped that patch 1.53, with its massive list of flight model changes, would improve things, but it wasn't to be. What I really don't understand is how Gaijin expects to attract and retain an American audience for this game, when they do this to one of the most iconic US fighters of World War II. 
Anyway, having said all that, the plane isn't completely unplayable. If you want to test your reserves of patience and discipline to the max, by all means, fly the D5. As I said earlier, it's a fighter for masochists, but there are people like that, who spurn the overpowered clubbing machines and instead look to master the most challenging of planes. And even with its flaws, the D5 can occasionally net you some decent kills, as I'm showing here from a 6 kill game, which to me felt better than a 20 kill game in a Fog of Wolf 190. However, please don't try to convince me that the D5's performance is correct, or that it's actually a great plane in War Thunder. I've read plenty of comments along those lines before, but I've rarely seen it backed by tangible results. Just last week on the forums there was a guy saying how much better this plane is than the Hispano P-51, yet in the Hispano plane he's averaging over 3 kills per flyout, with a kill to death ratio of over 4, and then the D5 is doing less than 1 kill per flyout and his KDR is barely positive. And looking through the stats of several of the best arcade pilots in War Thunder, I don't see anyone making it to 3 kills per flyout. Most are below 2. And these are people who regularly average 5 or more kills per flyout in most fighters. So if you want to fly a Mustang in War Thunder Arcade, and occasionally run up some decent kill counts, then I do suggest skipping this particular plane. Your options are the early models, which are the A36 and Hispano P51, or you could try your luck with the D30, which handles like the D5 and is just as flammable, but apparently has more engine power, so at least that's something. What I really hope though is that the D-Series receive the flight model they deserve, and that I can take this video offline and replace it with a far more positive one. Anyway, I'm sure there'll be plenty of comments, and I look forward to reading them. Please feel free to let me know exactly what you think. My next video will be an Analyze This, following which I'm making a stock survival guide on the J7W1 Shinden, so maybe you should subscribe if you haven't already done so. If you'd like to support the creation of these videos, which are a lot of work, this one certainly was, please visit my Patreon page, and that's all I have for you in this video. Until my next one, I wish you good hunting, and I will see you in the skies.